You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Welcome to Kootenai Community Church Adult Sunday School. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and I would like to read all of chapter 3, since we didn't get that done last week. We went into chapter 3 without reading it, if I remember right. Maybe we did read it. We'll read the chapter and then we'll open in prayer. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. And such confidence we have through Christ toward God, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory on account of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. Having therefore such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech, and are not as Moses who used to put a veil over his face that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because it is removed in Christ. But to this day... Whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we acknowledge that the Old Testament had a glory but that the, test, that the glory of the New Testament in Christ Jesus surpasses everything. And it is to him that we give homage and honor and praise. And this morning as we, we look into your word, we thank you that you have left us with this record so that we might know you, that we might know the greatness of your, your supreme glory, and that we might this morning worship that even as we study. And we'll thank you for what you're going to accomplish in our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So a lot of glory here, and we started in chapter 3 last week, (coughs) and I believe we finished all the way through verse 1, no, verse 2. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Paul reminds the Corinthians that he needs no letter of commendation, that in fact they are his letter of commendation, and the other churches he has talked about, they're his letter of commendation. He he mentions that in 1 Thessalonians. And then he, he says that the letter is written in our hearts, known and read by all men. And, and it is unfortunate, but that's, we are the letter often that people first encounter when it is the gospel that they're, they're being brought. It is often us. And we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning when we get to verse 3 after introductions. <laughs> so Paul says, he says, at least to others, if I am not apostle, at least to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. He reminds the Corinthians again that all the work he's done for them through the grace and by the grace of the Holy Spirit has, has resulted in their salvation. It's resulted in their, their uh, sanctification, their ongoing sanctification. And he is still combating, maybe that's a too strong a term, but still dealing with the um, the the misunderstandings and the uh, abuse of him by the, quote, super apostles, 
and others in the Corinthian church who do not give him his due. Now, it's not that Paul wants to be lifted up and he wants to have some sort of accolade, but he knows that he is the apostle of God. And if his words are dismissed, then great truth is lost in Corinth and for surrounding churches and for us today. So he has to make certain that they understand that the letter that is being written by the Spirit of God on their hearts is a result of what was planted those years before, the Word of God. And they have the Word of God, and he wants them to pay attention. So he talks about the fact that they are his letter, and then in verse 3, which we'll dive right in, um, he says, You are our letter, written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. Not a letter of Paul, but a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Paul did not claim that he wrote the letter on their hearts. He proclaimed that the Spirit of God had done so. He would take no, no credit or glory to himself. He, he acknowledges and even exults in the fact that it is the Spirit of God who wrote this letter on the hearts of the Corinthians. The letter was not written with ink, he said, and not written on stone tablets as in the time of Moses, but written by the Spirit of God on each and every Corinthian heart that had trusted Christ. We need to remind ourselves that God doesn't write letters on churches. He writes letters about churches in Revelation, but he doesn't write this letter on churches. He writes it on people, on individuals that make up the church, each and every person in the Christian church. <laughs> it is unfortunate sometimes, though, that the truth that the only... The only Bible the world ever sees or reads is in the lives of the followers of Christ. And so often, the Word of God is distorted by those lives, those who claim to be living it. Christ gets a bad reputation because of the lives of his sometimes so-called followers. In some cases, it is true that genuine believers fall, they fail and fall. But in many cases, what the world is seeing is charlatans who do not really believe the Scripture, nor do they accurately exposit it, nor do they teach it properly. The world sees the false proclaimers and it conflates them with genuine Christians. What is written on the hearts of believers needs to be lived out and all too often isn't. Barclay puts it this way. There is a great truth here, which is at once an inspiration and an awful warning. Every man is an open letter for Jesus Christ. Every Christian whether they like it or not, is an advertisement for Christianity. The honor of Christ is in the hands of his followers. We judge a shopkeeper by the kind of goods he sells. We judge a craftsman by the kind of articles he produces. We judge a church by the kind of men it creates, and therefore men judge Christ by his followers. This was a man who did some open-air preaching. Dick Shepard, after years of talking in the open air to people who were outside the church, declared that he had discovered that the greatest handicap the church has is the unsatisfactory lives of professing Christians. When we go out into the world, we have the awe-inspiring responsibility of being open letters, advertisements for Christ and his church. Now, that being said, I am grateful that that is not all God, not all God has to rely on. He relies on himself, on his Son, on his Holy Spirit, and on his written word, which never changes, never makes a mistake, never fails, never comes up short when we do. But we should seek not to. We should seek to follow. We should seek to be the kind of letter, an advertisement that isn't a bait and switch, an advertisement that is true, an advertisement that is a... Um, I don't, I, I'm, I'm coming up short on metaphors, but that brings people in because of the right reasons. Not because of fun, not because of loudness, not because of in your face, but because of the written, finished, perfect Word of God. That is our advertisement. This is our billboard. <coughs> Paul knew that men can only write letters with ink, but the Spirit of the living God can write a life from the heart outward. He had done so with Paul himself, and he was doing it in the lives of the Corinthians. They needed to pay attention to this and remember that the Paul that brought them the message at the beginning, who stayed with them through their difficulties and continues to love them despite their attacks on him, is the same Paul that is speaking to them in this letter. Any questions or comments about verse 3? Are we a good open-air advertisement for the Lord Jesus Christ? That should be something on our minds and our hearts often. 
So where does our confidence fall? Where did Paul's confidence come from? He says in verse 4, he says, Such confidence we have through Christ toward God. Far from claiming any glory or sufficiency for himself, Paul ascribes to God all of the work of building a church in Corinth with believers chosen by a sovereign God, maintaining those believers through thick and thin and demonstrating to the world the wonder of salvation in Christ. Every time a sinner is saved, it is a miracle. It is a miracle. It is an impossible thing to happen with men. Impossible. No, no, we can't gin up the will. We can't gin up the, the feelings. It's, it's impossible. It's like climbing Mount Everest in your underwear with a bungee cord. Is that good enough? It ain't happening. It's even more impossible than that. That could accidentally happen. Don't, don't you guys have CGI on your computers? You can do anything, man. But far from claiming any sufficiency, Paul gives all the glory to God. His confidence has always been in his Lord and not in himself. But he does know that the Lord uses him and will continue to use him to bring the gospel to the world, to a world that hates God. Make no mistake, the world hates God. They don't just dislike him. They hate him. They live in darkness. We did. Everyone in here did and loved that darkness, preferred that darkness, until the Spirit of God regenerated our hearts and changed our minds, changed our souls, so that we became, by his, chosen, by his choosing, an elect child of God. The false apostles and the super apostles, by contrast, were self-confident. They were arrogant and rash, trusting in their own work. Paul knew that anything that would last had to be done by the Lord himself. These apostles, and we will meet them chapters hence, in chapter 10 is where it starts, where most of it starts. They put great confidence in themselves in their letters of commendation, probably from the Sanhedrin, as we talked about early, earlier. It bears notice that the confidence that Paul had, it's okay, do you know it's okay to be confident? It's okay to be confident, just not arrogant. There's a, kind of, there's a difference in a proper kind of confidence, a confidence in the Lord, not a confidence in yourself. The confidence that Paul had... And that the true people of God to have does not manifest itself the way the confidence of the world does. It is a firm, quiet conviction that what God has said is completely true and trustworthy and that he will bring what he wants to pass every single time, no matter what the circumstances look like. The child of God needs but be obedient. That is the confidence that a child of God can have. That is the confidence that Paul had. He had no confidence in himself. He knew he was fickle. He got mad and, and booted Mark. He had an argument with Barnabas. Um, there were numerous other things. That's one of the wonderful things about the Word of God. It does not hide the warts of the, the, even the great founders of the church. They had problems. They were human. And God does not hide that. But God works through that. And it was this conf Paul had this kind of confidence because he knew who was building the church in Corinth. And he knew that nothing could prevail against the church. Nothing. Because God was doing it. Any comments or questions about verse 4? Amen. We can be a testimony even with our own faults. It bears notice that this confidence that Paul had, I said, was humble. But Charles Hodge put it this way. He said, the confidence of the world, the confidence of the apostle that he was what God had called him to be, and able or fit minister of the gospel, was not a trait of natural character. It was not a conclusion from his inward and outward experience. Did you get that? It wasn't a conclusion from his experience. It was one of the forms in which the Spirit of God, which was in him, manifested itself or himself. Just as the Spirit manifested himself in his humility, faith, courage, or constancy, it is easy to determine whether such confidence is self-inflation or the, or, the, or the strength for the strength of God and the soul. If the former, it has a natural concomitance of pride. If it's a manly kind of, human kind of confidence, it has the natural concomitance of pride, arrogance, indifference, contempt of others. If it is the latter, it is attended by self-abhorrence, meekness, long-suffering, a willingness to be the least and the lowest, and by all the graces of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, against these things, there is no law. This is the kind of confidence that a child of God will have. Yes, Charles Hodge. That's the kind of confidence Paul had and the kind of confidence that we can have. It is a quiet, 
humble confidence, knowing that the work that God is doing will, will come to pass and will last. And then he talks about adequacy. This is an interesting word. Verse 5. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Now, here in subsequent, Paul fleshes it out. He points out that it is not he himself that is competent to do anything, but rather his competency comes from God. The word that is translated adequacy should not be confused with our sometimes rendering of the word when we say, well, he was adequate to the task. It's, it's almost a, he, his head was just above the water of the task. That's not what this means. That's not what this word means. Often in modern parlance, adequate means just enough, suitable, okay. The original meaning in Greek is more of a competency and an ability, power or fitness to handle a situation. It's, it's the situation where you would not send a four-year-old to fight a battle. You would send a warrior, and the warrior is competent to do that, and you know it, and he knows it. That's the kind of company, not, not somebody who's just, just okay, but he has the ability to do it. That's what God does with his children when he sends them out to take the gospel to the world. He doesn't just make us heads above water where we're okay. He makes us fit, able, powerful in that sense. As you can see, the noun form, uh, which is only used here in the scripture, and the word means sufficiency or ability of power. That, you can see that. When it is used as an adjective, it is a bit more descriptive, and it includes the idea of worthiness, considerable, sufficient, strong. When God fits someone for his work, he imbues them with the power to accomplish that work. Paul did not credit anything to himself, which is the sense of the Greek word translated consider. He did not logically calculate that what was happening was his work. He did not credit building the church to himself, but rather to God. He recognized that every bit of competency that he had was itself, as salvation was, a gift from God. The gifts that he had that he used, his gifts of teaching, of administration, his apostle, the gift of being an apostle, those were all gifts from God. And every single person in this body that is a born-again believer has competency in Christ, competency from God. So if you ever feel inadequate... It's okay to recognize that from a human point of view. But from God's point of view, he has made you fit to do his work, even not fall down up front. Verse, verse 6, and then I'll ask if there's any questions because this is a long one. Who, has also, who also has made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And here... One verse later, the word adequate occurs again as an adjective. It occurs 39 times as an adjective in the New Testament, and it connotes again the idea of power, sufficiency, and ability. It's the amount, it's the fact that the engine will drop a couple, the transmission will drop a couple of gears and pull that trailer all the way to the top of the hill. It's fully capable of doing it. You, I'm not comparing you to hay trailers or trucks, but you are fully capable to do what God has called you to do. We need to never let that become a point of arrogance or a point of holier than thou. It's an incredible miracle that God does in the lives of his followers that he makes them, he makes us competent to do his work. What a, what a, what a treasure, what a, what a responsibility. Paul here repeats what he has taught many other places. The Old Testament, the covenant of works, cannot save and in fact was designed to drive people to despair themselves. Indeed, every aspect of the Old Covenant to anyone who paid attention would imply that perfection, which humans cannot achieve, was necessary to be in the presence of God upon death. Therefore, no man could achieve salvation. At the fall, grace was given. The Mosaic Covenant is suffused with the idea of grace as well, in that the people are to trust, that is to have faith in the God of the Covenant, not in the Covenant itself. When Jesus answered the, answered the lawyer who asked him what he needed to do to inherit eternal life, he asked him a question. He asked him, what did the law say? The lawyer's answer was instructive and, and uh, indicates that the average Jew understood what they understood from the Old Testament. Here's what the lawyer said, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Whoops. And Jesus, and he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? And, the, and he answered, the, the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. 
And he said to him, Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. The focus was on faith, was on love. It wasn't on, he didn't recite the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are fine. Don't, don't take away from here that that teacher said the Ten Commandments are bad. No, no, no. But what the well, lawyer's answer was instructive. The ratification of justification by faith is the cross. And the new covenant, which was the apex of the salvation of men by grace through faith. This, the cross ratified justification by faith throughout history. And it was the apex, the pinnacle of salvation by faith. The old covenant brought despair and hopeless. That is not to say there was no hope because men and women understood that understood the implications were complete, that were completely evident would have hope in the God of the old covenant by placing their faith and trust in him, just as Abraham did. And it was credited to him as righteousness. What did he do? Well, he sac almost sacrificed Isaac. No. Well, he came out of Ur of the Chaldees. No. He believed God. That's what the scripture says. Abraham did a lot of cool stuff, but it didn't earn him one stripe. What he did was he believed God. But the new covenant is the covenant of the Holy Spirit, and it brings life, joy, and blessing. Christ's death provided the way of salvation for all who trusted under the old covenant and for all who will trust under the new covenant. And, and when Jim gets to it in this century, I think, Hebrews chapter 8, will detail this. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 16 through 13. It's almost like I'm stealing his thunder, but you will have, will have forgotten, so it's good. But now, Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says, he, Christ, has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the meditate mediator of a better covenant. The New Testament is a better testament which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, this is Jehovah, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he had said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And the author of the Hebrews applies that to the church, to the, new, to the, new, to the Bible, to the believers, to modern believers, to believers at the time. As Paul said, the letter of the law kills, for no one can keep it. How much do you have to fail to violate the law? 20%? 40%? Come on, aren't there any, aren't there any Excel masters in here? 42%. One point. If you fail in one point, in James chapter 2, 10 says, you are guilty of all of it. God requires... Not 98 or 99 or 99 to the Googleplex decimal point. He requires 100% perfection, and only his son ever did that. And so the law drives us to Christ. <laughs> but the spirit who gives grace unto obedience gives life. And so the Judaizers who preferred the letter of the law could only bring death to Corinth. These false teachers that were following Paul around and trying to upend what he was doing. They weren't trying to upend him. They just didn't believe he was telling the truth. They were false teachers. They were demon teachers. <clears throat> um, the gospel, the gospel breathes life into dead sinners by virtue of grace, a work done only and purely by God in his sovereign capacity. And that is what gives life. The gospel gives life. The word of God gives life. So that's, we covered quite a bit of ground there. Any questions on five and five and six? Peter. The re responsibilities under the old covenant have been done away with. It has. As of the finish of the canon of scripture, where we have everything we need, the old covenant is no longer necessary. And the Judaizers would argue against that. 
They would say, no, you need to be circumcised. No, you need to, and then they would lay out whatever it was that you had to do in addition to believing the gospel. And they were wrong. The old covenant was done. It was finished. It was completed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and fully explained as completed, I guess I would say, in the canon of Scripture when it was fulfilled and finished. Yes. He does. Hi, Thomas. Have a nice day. <laughs> fulfilled. The contract has been fulfilled. That's a good way to put it. Pardon? And that ends it. Now, so the ceremonial laws, we no longer have to, to, to wave grain or kill doves or sacrifice animals, but the moral law continues. The moral law continues. Those things that God said will are sin if you don't do them. That continues. And that's, in a nutshell, that's what the Ten Commandments is. The Ten Commandments kids, co continues. You still have to honor your parents. You still have to love only your wife and not covet your neighbor's stuff, unless he has a craftsman lawnmower. But <laughs> Honda, okay, Honda. So the moral law continues, but the fulfillment of the Old Testament, all the sacrifices that had to be done to appease God have been culminated in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter. So is it fair to say that the moral law of the Ten Commandments are, are not necessarily the covenant? The covenant was using that. The Ten Commandments are still in effect. They're not a covenant. They're, a They're part of the covenant. Declaration. But the, 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 the disposition of the, that part of the covenant that was necessary to appease God has been satisfied. So I guess you could put it your way. Where's... Well, I'm just I'm thinking about it as I'm witnessing to somebody. I use the law right. to convict them of their sin. And that's what the law is good for. And if they come out and say, well, hold on, that covenant's done. I'm not, I'm not accountable for that. I want to be able to say, no, no, hold on. The ceremonial law, the covenant with Israel is done. The Ten Commandments still apply. The law is still used to convict sinners of their inability to, com to keep it. Primarily sacrifice. Superseded. superseded. That would be a good way to look at it. But the, the, but the law itself, Paul says it's good. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at it. The Ten Commandments is not a covenant. It's yeah, it's, it's the bylaws, if you will. Of the, It's the charter of the, uh, I'm coming up short here. It's a constitution of, I better not use, probably shouldn't use. <laughs> He brought the Ten Commandments down from Sinai. I, I'm with you there. Yeah. Saying, but he brought everything down. The, back to that, the New Covenant declared the first one is old. It's not referring to the Ten Commandments. No. Okay. Nope. That's one of the things they are. They're the mirror we hold up. Paul talks about that, about what the law is for. If it is used lawfully... can't fulfill any of it yeah all we have to do is violate one aspect of it just one and we're done Jess through Christ the grace of the Holy Spirit working in our lives daily sanctifying us grace upon grace we become able to fulfill even the moral law but it's a work of Christ it's not a work of me and that's that's what Paul says that my adequacy is in Christ not in myself does that help I think you've got it. You bet. Now I got to figure out where I was. So, 
Verse, any other questions? Verse 7. But if the ministry of death, this is what Paul's calling the Old Testament, in letters engraved on stones came with glory, it did have glory, so that if the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading of it was, as it was, and I'm going to read verse 8. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? So, the law, which brings condemnation and recognition that God's demands cannot be kept, came with the glory so much so that when Moses descended from the mountain with the law written on the tablets, his face shone so greatly that the Israelites could not look upon it. That glory faded with time. The Old Testament had a glory that was overshadowed by the glory of the New Testament, of the New Covenant, and that glory will never fade. Verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? Paul asks the rhetorical question in order to demonstrate to the Corinthians that the glory of the Old Testament is completely overshadowed by the ministry of the Spirit of God in the New Testament. The law is good, Paul has said here and elsewhere. What shall we say then? Romans 7, 7. Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would, have, I would, have, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. Now, what law is he talking about? Is he talking about the requirement to wave grain at a certain time? He's not. He's talking about God's moral law. That law convicted me, convicted Paul, he said, of sin. On the contrary, I would not have come to know the sin except through the law, for I would have not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. And that's an interesting thing. I, I, I can... I can, um, I can I can kind of give you a, an anecdotal, if you will, that helped me understand that. When I was in high school, um, we, had some, we had black folks in the community, and we were, at one point, someone came into the high school and started teaching us about not being racist. We didn't know what racism was here in this little rural backwater county. They were just friends. What do you mean racist? Isn't that driving too fast? So... Had I not known, had I, before I knew that racism was a sin, I didn't know what it was. So the law came in and said, don't be racist. And I went, oh, okay, I won't. But before that, <laughs> apparently we had it written on our hearts, we just didn't know. But that's, that's kind of what's happened. Until I actually knew something was wrong, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do it. And so we weren't doing it, but at any rate, that's kind of an example. There were people who were coveting, and maybe they didn't know it was wrong. But once the law came in and said, you can't take what you can't lust after and take what other people have. Well, I can't. Why not? Because God said so. Now they're violating the law. That came, it comes in. Now they know they're violating the law. And Paul says, I would never have known had the law not said, you shall not covet. Romans 7, 12. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So the law and the commandments are good. They're righteous. Psalm 19, 7 and 8. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the, law, the eyes. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, Paul says, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. And one of the ways to use the law is to convict sinners of their inability to keep it. Another way to use the law is to obey the grace of the Holy Spirit in obeying, in keeping the moral law of God. Not in, not in your own self, but with the adequacy that God gives you to do that. Before, as, as salvation, you didn't even want to, really. Maybe you did. Some of us, some people, there are, you know, there's, there, people don't sin as much as they can, but, but people are depraved, completely depraved. But when the law comes in and convicts us, and then the Lord comes in and changes our mind, we are regenerated, and we trust Christ in salvation, then day by day, we become more able, as more and more is made available and aware to us, made us aware of, to keep God's precepts. So maybe you didn't know you had offended someone until the Spirit of God enlightened your heart, and you began to realize that certain words have an effect on people. And I'm, a, I'm guilty of using those certain words. I wonder if I've offended so-and-so. And... -so. and you kind of know you have. <laughs> Actually, you really know you have. <laughs> but you're playing that little game with yourself. Well, if it was 20% me and 20% them and 80% circumstances, but that adds up to 120%. What am I doing here? 
So God's law comes in. Your conscience is, is enlightened, invigorated, and you begin making things right. That's what, the, that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's the adequacy, the competency that comes from being a child of God. But the law was never designed to save, but rather to drive the sinner to God, to the God who can save. Whether the Old Testament saints where saints had faith in God and their faith was credited as righteousness just as Abraham's or in the New Testament where the same thing happens when we trust Christ for his finished and complete work on the cross which brings men salvation. If the Old Testament ministry had glory, Paul is telling the Corinthians that the New Testament ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ has far more. And it does. It indeed does. What do you have to do? To be, what did the Philippian jailer have to do to, to become a Christian? What did he have to do? Believe. He didn't have to do a whole bunch of things. He had to believe, just as Abraham had to do. For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, verse 9, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Glory was important to the Corinthians. They were, um, they were unfortunately, braggadocio, and they liked to um, point out their smarts. I've got wisdom. They were, that was a Greek... Uh, a Greek component of, this, of the, the um, personality, unfortunately. Self-righteousness, self-importance, self-aggrandizement. There we go. Um, the language Paul here uses here will reach these kind of people who, who believe that glory is important. There was a certain glory in the ministry of condemnation. That was the ministry of the Old Testament, but much more glory in the ministry of the New Testament of righteousness. The law could never save, again, Paul drives this point home in epistle after epistle, but it could demonstrate to its readers the need for something that could save. John MacArthur said this, he put it this way. He said, Old Testament saints were not saved. Old Testament saints were not saved by keeping the law, but being broken over their inability to keep it. They came to, to God, they came to God under impenitence, hungering, and thirsting for righteousness, and mourning over their sin. That's in Matthew chapter 5, verses 2 through 7. God then mercifully and graciously forgave their sins based on what Christ would accomplish in the future by his substitutionary death, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Having been saved by grace through faith, the Old Testament saints found the moral law a source of blessing and joy. They could then exult with the psalmist, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119, if you want some references, Psalm 119.97, Psalm 119.113, Psalm 119.165, and Psalm 119.163. The law then became to them more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. It was not their attitude to the law that saved them. Rather, salvation changed their attitude to the law. And they repented and in faith sought God's gracious forgiveness. And so I can, anybody who wants that list of scriptures, I can send it to you. The Old Testament remained the ministry of condemnation and ultimately of damnation. All of God's people are brought to this bar and find that they cannot surmount it. They cannot jump over it. It had a certain glory indeed, but the ministry of righteousness in the New Testament abounds in glory, Paul says. This word translated abound is a word that means superabundance, to overflow. It has the idea of plentifulness, way more than can be imagined. It's far more than is necessary, or it is just exactly what is necessary. So today, as, and for us today, and for the Corinthians in this day, in their day, Paul is reminding them of a number of things here. They are the letter that God is writing in Corinth. They are the ones who are communicating to the Greek culture around them the word of God. And often, isn't it your person that gets you audience with someone else? You don't come up to them, smack them over the head with a big Bible and say, I want to talk to you about the Lord. You become, you become their acquaintance. Maybe it's on, on the street, one-shot deal and you give them a tract, but it's you that they see first. They probably, remarkably, there are probably a lot of people around today that have never even read anything in the Bible. 
The only exposure they've ever had to it is the misquotes that come on TV or in the newspaper. So don't be surprised when maybe the reception isn't as warm as you would like it to be for someone who brings the gospel. But we can persevere and, and uh, bring them. And, and as Peter's been talking about, the, the important thing to bring them is you can't sugarcoat it. They, if they don't have Christ, they are going to hell. There's no second chance. There's no purgatory, which is in Kansas, by the way. There's no way out. It's a one-way trip on a very wide road that everybody's going on. Well, everybody's doing it, said the child in seventh grade, and his mother said, no, they're not. You're not. You want them on the wide road. Paul took so many of these Corinthians by the grace of God and moved them from the wide road to the narrow road. Excuse me, you want them on the narrow road. <laughs> Get your metaphor straight, guy. From the wide road to the narrow road. He took them from the, the glory of the Old Testament, which could only bring them to Christ, to the glory of the New Testament, which is Christ. And so we'll, we'll, we'll end up today. Are there any questions? More questions about anything before we close up, before we end? You are the letter that people are reading today. When they have an exposure to you, do they have an exposure to the gospel, the graciousness? And I don't mean that you're going to walk up to them and start quoting scripture, but do they have an exposure to a, a heart that has been changed by the gospel and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or do they have exposure to the world, more of the world? We are the letter that is read of men today. The Corinthians were the letter that was read. And the commendation that comes from, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, um, is the person that wrote this letter, the Lord Jesus Christ, on your heart, is he being lifted up, glorified, and exalted when people see you? Or is he being looked down upon? Are we a good translation? I guess that's one way to put it. Are we a good translation of the gospel out into the world today? The way we, the most important way that we can make sure we are is by studying the word, studying the word of God and submitting to his, demand, his, response, his demands on our lives in obedience. And the Holy Spirit will cause that to be lived out and you and I, hopefully, and the Corinthians in this day will be a good letter to be read by the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that uh, by your sovereign power, you have made a decision that the people of this world will read your gospel sometimes first in the lives of your followers. We want to be pure representations of the gospel by the grace of the Spirit in our lives. We would like to be proper translations, if you will, Father, of the, word of, your, of the word of your spirit to the world, always directing people back to the word of God and to you. For it is you who save, it is you who bring ch children of God to glory, the glory that is evidenced in the New Testament, much overshadowing the old. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.